You guys can see the shared screen. Something in chat. Okay. Cool. So today's lecture, also on Thursday, we're going to be talking about how to access, how to get all these different biomolecules we've been talking about, either commercially or making them yourself. And when you make those, or if you're trying to get them, uh, how do you purify and isolate them so you're confident that you have just the molecule that you're interested in? Um, so yeah, the goal is today, hopefully you'll understand some of the commercial sources and I guess we can call it do it yourself. Approaches for making, for getting biomolecules. And with this do-it-yourself, I guess some of the equipment that's required for that. Um, we're going to focus quite a bit on the production of proteins. Um, and the terminology used in the pharma industry understand what we mean by upstream and downstream by the end of this lecture um, we're going to talk about a couple different methods for extraction and purifying biomolecules. Um, and I just wanna clarify, okay, we have our schematic down here, but today, how much of are these instruments versus equipment versus methods that I would say this is more of a methods-based lecture than actual, I guess, instrumentation. If we're gonna say instruments measure something or quantify and methods are more about, I guess, techniques, production, I guess, trying to have some effort to produce something we can argue about what English language intricacies of what those terminologies are, but at least for today, that's what we're gonna discriminate between methods and instrumentation. So because we're focusing more on methods, there's not really unified terms that I can put down here for sources or samples or detectors that within these methods, we're gonna be using a lot, we're gonna be using some of the instrumentation that we've talked about previously to have as checkpoints during the, the methods uh, in that process. Um, so focusing on the first half of making biomolecules um, for this lecture, and like I've been mentioning, focus of the first two thirds of this class or so are focusing on small bio, biomolecules. And I guess we're, three, four weeks away for getting to talk about more cells and organisms. Um, so uh, when we're talking about small biomolecules, we've been talking about them so far. Can you guys remind me of what different classes of biomolecules there are when we introduce these in lecture one? What different classes of biomolecules are there that we divide them up that are important in biophysics? Okay. We got proteins, lipids, 
nucleic acids, and sugars. Got them all covered. Thanks, guys. Um, so we're going to go into detail, like I said, about proteins and also nucleic acids. And I want to mention with lipids and sugars that you typically get these commercially. So I've listed here Avanti polar lipids is a common place that you can get. Obviously lipids are known for um, producing very pure lipids. Uh, so that's a common producer. And then I would say for sugars, um, like Sigma, Thermo Fisher, et cetera, that typically that's how you're getting your lipids and sugars, you're not making these uh, yourself. So the way that these companies make or extract lipids or sugars is that they're going to be biologically derived. In contrast to the alternative to deriving them biologically would be like doing synthetic chemistry to like make them from small molecules as starting materials and synthesizing them. But lipids and sugars, it's much more cost effective and they're produced at large scales or high quantities just naturally in from, you can say bacteria, um, plants, eukaryotes. So like in my lab, we use agro sugar and the way that that's produced is they have algae produces agarose. So they just take big batches of algae, break them up, and extract just that sugar with some of the purification steps that I'll discuss later. Um, and similarly with lipids, they're going to grow some certain types of cells that have the desired lipids, break those cells apart, and extract and purify uh, the lipid of interest. Um, so uh, the concepts that we'll discuss later of purification and extraction would be a step in getting these lipids and sugars, but with the biological derivation, it can be from organisms or cell cultures. And we'll talk about later like a bioreactor to help grow those organisms or cells to high, uh, have a large number of them. Okay. So lipids and sugars, quick to cover where you get them at. Um, Moving on to nucleic acids, uh, there's two primary ways to get your desired nucleic acids if you want uh, just a single type there. Um, if you, the first is if you have your starting nucleic acid, if you have um, your desired molecule, you can use polymerase, polymerase chain reaction. PCR. Um, and with this, you can generate large number of copies um, from a small initial sample. So we can say that's like an amplification of the numbers. So I think it's like you can get about a million more copies in let's say about four hours or so. Uh, that's how quickly it can be amplified. Um, so PCR actually won the 1993 Nobel Prize in Chemistry um, to Kerry Mullis. And just as some backstory, he was working at a corporation called Cetus Corporation. And the idea was kind of there, and uh, but the people that were working on it didn't really recognize the power of PCR. And Kerry Mullis was the one that like recognized uh, the potential for it. So he received the Nobel Prize, but there's a little bit of controversy behind there. People at the company are a little contentious about 
him receiving that prize instead of like the team that was working there. Um, so just interesting backstory of like some drama that's back there, but the corporation got like the patent for it. So they got a bunch of money that way. So I don't think they should be that upset. Um, but in PCR, getting back to this, uh, I have all the steps here listed as denaturation, annealing and extension. So uh, this is a loop that it'll keep repeating over and over again, going through these steps. And the first step here is you have your starting, let's say you have your starting double strand DNA molecule here. First step is to denature that and make each strand a single strand by bringing it up to a high temperature here. So then you have each individual strand. And then in the annealing process, you lower down that temperature and you introduce, I guess, introduced into this step, you need to have DNA polymerase. Um, you need a primer. And then you need the nucleotides. And I guess you need your starting DNA. So these are all of your reactants that you put in the PCR. Starting DNA denatured in the first step, so they're single strands. Second step, annealing, lower that temperature down. And the primer are these short DNA fragments that will uh, bind to the single-stranded DNA, and they're telling the DNA polymerase, okay, this is where you need to start. This is where you need to recognize and start assembling the DNA chain. So with this annealing step, that's bringing the primers together with the single strands of DNA. And then the third step, the temperature is increased again. The DNA polymerase nucleotides are introduced, and you then have a uh, then you have the polymerase extend and copy this DNA, the single-stranded DNA chains. So at the end of this, you'll have, let's here, I'll sketch this out. Double sketch, but you'll have obviously two strands, two double strands of DNA that then you can loop back up and denature again. Um, uh, some Things to point out is the DNA polymerase. You can see here it's indicated as TAC polymerase. And I'll add that here. And this TAC just means it's a heat resistant form of DNA polymerase. So when you're undergoing this loop and going to have very high temperatures of 94 Celsius or so, that the polymerase doesn't denature and degrade itself. So this is Polymerase is extracted from like archaea ba bacteria that live in very hot temperatures um, and can resist that um, and stuff. So mentoring PCR, if you guys remember your bio box visit, if you call it that, um, I think several of you guys presented on the different PCRs that are present in the bio box there. So if you need to be doing this in a 96 well plate for different different concentrations of DNA or different uh, forms of DNA, they have that option or uh, more large scale PCR options here. Um, so that's one way to form nucleic acids if you have your starting nucleic acid. The other way is doing chemical synthesis of nucleic acids. So this would be if you do not have your starting nucleic acid, if you want something that's unique no starting process, no starting product. Then you actually have to synthesize your nucleic acid, I guess, nucleotide by nucleotide. And this is typically done on a, a chip or solid state support. So you'll have 
your strands fixed on some type of like a silicon chip or so, you can then flow in a new nucleotide, have it react here, rinse, and continue on and on with that process. So I'd say, at least in my experience, I haven't seen in a lab a solid state um, chemical synthesizer for nucleic acids. Um, I think probably in like the biotech industry, that's more common, but at least in academic labs, what I've seen so far is relying on commercial sources for this. So integrated DNA technologies is what I've seen people use the most that they'll do the chemical synthesis for you. Um, it's relatively, say it's relatively inexpensive. And then they'll give you that nucleic acid that then you can then take to the PCR um, uh, or use a prep kit to then uh, produce more nucleic acids on your own. But they'll give you that unique starting nucleic acid product there. So any questions with nucleic acids? So we'll moving on to the chunk of this lecture talking about um, protein synthesis and purification. And like I mentioned in pharma, there's two different terms of upstream, which will be producing proteins, and then the downstream you've made those proteins, okay, how do you separate them? And we'll be talking about different methods today and on Thursday as well. These include centrifugation, dialysis, um, and chromatography. Maybe on Thursday we'll mention uh, precipitation as well. Um, and this terminology of upstream and downstream for, I guess we have some chemical engineers in the audience is also used like with the oil industry upstream, how can you extract the oil downstream? How do you purify and separate different components in that oil um, to get your desired chemical Product. So the same terminology is used in uh, pharma as well. Um, and then after you separate and have your pure product, you also have to characterize it um, or confirm that it's pure. And we've talked about obviously lots of light-based characterization techniques, getting data out, understanding that. Um, but in the production of proteins, um, confirming that you have a pure product there's electrophoresis, um, sequence analysis, and mass spec are the common ways of then confirming that your protein is pure. So we'll be talking about mass spec next week. Um, I guess maybe on Thursday, we'll also mention some electrophoresis uh, characterization um, and the like. So this is how I categorize the different areas of okay, making proteins, purifying them, characterizing them. Uh, so the reason we're focusing on the production of proteins so much is that it has an impact on a wide array of, wide array of fields. That's why there's such a chunk of this lecture on this. Um, I'm going to switch the order a little bit. Uh, should have moved that slide a little later. So just to give you an example, okay, I already mentioned the pharmaceutical industry, but being able to produce many of the drugs that are being developed today and being used are no longer small molecule. Okay, if you think of for a long time, anything before like the 1980s, I'd say, You'd have your drug molecules that have some benzene rings and some carbons and some fluorines, who knows. 
but it's going to be something that you would picture an organic chemist uh, at a bench working with like clear colored solutions and solvents trying to make like these very nice organic molecules that then you put in a pill. I'd say more recently transition in the 1990s and anything after the 2000s pharmaceutical industry has really shifted gears to making biologics which is protein based and also some nucleic acid based Therapeutic. So you can see there's a lot of different, um, these are all protein based pharmaceutical products. And I mean, obviously, as I've heard of insulin, um, talking about vaccines, that's a hot topic now, obviously. Investigating antibody based vaccines um, or the antibody, monoclonal antibody cocktails for treatments and the like that being able to then produce these proteins and separate them will then lead to some nice drugs that we can use. And actually, maybe for the past, I'm gonna say six years now, the number one selling drug in the world is Humira. I'm sure you guys have seen commercial, well, if you watch TV with commercials instead of streaming stuff, uh, there's always commercials for Humira um, and the citrate free version now. And I mean, you can see the huge scope of sales there. So being able to make these and uh, develop drugs, you need to be able to produce and separate those. Uh, um, outside the pharmaceutical industry, being able to make and produce enzymes um, for lots of industrial applications are listed here. Um, fermentation, I mean, I like cheese and beer, so I think that's important. <laughs> uh, and you can see that in the agricultural industry, again, pharmaceutical industry down here, uh, the food industry that having a large amount of enzymes available to carry out these digestion processes to make the food that we eat uh, and drink uh, is important as well. So those are just some broad scale applications of why we wanna be able to make proteins. And getting into how the upstream processes. So I'll write upstream up here. Um, if we're focusing on small proteins with peptides, do you guys remember back from lecture one what our rough cutoff was for differentiating between a peptide and a protein? Yeah, Colin says 50. 50 amino acids or so is approximate cutoff. So if you're working with something that's on the smaller side, you can use peptide synthesis to make your peptide of interest. And peptide synthesis is very similar to what I was discussing with like the chemical synthesis of the nucleic acids. You build this like amino acid by amino acid, brick by brick. Uh, with your Legos there. Um, so if you're working with, let's say, extremely short, let's say less than 10 amino acids or so, you can do this by hand. We're here when we're building these peptides, you're going to be hooking up your amine group to your carboxylic acid group. So you'll mix amino acid one plus amino acid two plus your other reactants. And those will be linked together. And then there's still gonna be some excess of your reactants. So then you have to like do a purification step to remove this excess and then you can then add in your amino acid three and repeat this over and over again. So it does take some time, uh, but if it's yeah less than 10 amino acids, straightforward enough that you can do that by yourself. And this purification step, like you will have some loss of product here. 
So people do do this by hand on the bench top. Um, but if your lab is making lots of amino acids or if they're longer, so lots of peptides or longer peptides, that's when you'll see a peptide synthesizer. So I have one picture here where you can see that each of these bottles or each of these tubes up here is gonna be like an individual amino acid. So the 20 or so reactants there. And then it's automated computer control to then pump the different reagents in and have those reactions take themselves. So with a peptide synthesizer, just like with the DNA or the nucleic acid synthesizer, you're gonna have a solid phase support. So some, these are typically um, some type of bead, polymer bead or so. And you'll have your peptide on the surface. You'll come in and add another peptide. Then there's gonna be a protecting group added. And then you can then flow and rinse out. I guess let's say this is amino acid one here. Then in the next step, you can then remove that protecting group. And then you can add amino acid two in and then loop through this. So the solid phase support allows for rinsing um, and I guess protecting the peptide. Uh, so if you look into detail about peptide synthesis, there's a lot of different chemical options for having those protecting groups um, that lead to higher uh, products concentrations and people uh, have their different preferences. But this is somewhat automated and is nice um, if you're gonna be using a lot of peptide. So you'll see labs that specialize in using peptides, they'll have these in their lab. But if you just need one or two peptides or so, you can even get these um, locally at the Cleveland Clinic Learner Research Institute. They have a molecular biotechnology core and they have a peptide synthesizer there that then you can order and have them make a peptide for you themselves and they can work with different chiralities of the different amino acids, they can incorporate fluorescent tags in there. So it's nice, just like integrated DNA technologies will do your nucleic acid synthesis, you can also outsource source this um, to core facilities to do this. Any questions with peptide synthesis at all? So if you're, I think the limit of peptide synthesi synthesizers is around 70 amino acids. So I guess with our rough cutoff of 50, you can say you can make some very small proteins around 70 amino acids or so. This limit is because once they get too long, you're going to have lots of conformational, you can have conformational changes, you can have crowding that limits the access of the amino acids to then react with the protein that is on the solid phase support. So that's why 70 is about the limit there. So if you wanna work with something larger than 70 amino acids, you have to get to protein production. So there's two different ways. This is kind of a overview of um, protein production. So one way is you can genetically engineer your cells, cells to produce the protein that you want. And we're going to go over uh, this in more detail. And it's called recombinant expression. 
Or the second option is similar to what we discussed with uh, lipids and sugars, is that you can find some biological source that has the protein that you're interested in. So I'd say like an example of this would be lysozyme from egg whites, or when we've talked about like BSA, they just get that from like cow's blood itself. So uh, those would be using biological sources where there's like a high amount of protein. It wouldn't make sense to do this by recombinant expression instead. So either way with the biological material or the cells, from an industrial standpoint, you'd be doing this in a bioreactor. If you were doing this in a lab setup, it's a much smaller scale there. Um, and you have to first extract, I guess, the crude product, um, concentrate it, and then I guess we'll talk about purification. So we're going to be talking about like this extraction step, um, the concentration and the purification. Then from an industrial standpoint, then you would even do further steps. Um, and even in the lab, you'll do this where you want it in the right buffer. Uh, let's just say that this is like the right surroundings. Since you don't want your end product to be destabilized, denatured, and the like, and um, you may even drying this product would be called lysolizing if you like flash flash dry it so it's still stable. And obviously, we're not in the lab sense. We're not talking about like final packaging and labeling and this stuff. So this is just like an overall view of okay, in the bioreactor make a lot of the protein, then let's try to get that protein out by first crude product, concentrating, purifying it and the like. So focusing on this first step here, if you wanna do a recombinant expression, what does that mean? Um, so recombinant expression is uh, engineering cells to produce your desired protein. Here we're still upstream. Um, the reason it's called recombinant expression is you're using recombinant DNA typically. So what do we mean by recombinant? That means that it's um, lab modified DNA. So it has parts, pone, parts, pieces from different organisms. So like we've talked about fluorescent proteins. If you wanna be making a fluorescent protein attached to some other protein of interest, well that fluorescent protein is gonna be from a jellyfish. And then we're gonna talk about like some other portions of this DNA that are from bacteria. Um, your protein of interest might be a human protein. So you're kind of playing the mad scientist and putting things together um, and using um, genetic engineering methods. Um, so I mentioned already, like you can do fluorescent proteins. You can also do mutations. So again, getting this DNA, you can order this. You can also do some of the work yourself. But the mutations, I do want to note, we've talked about some mutations in proteins. You can do point mutations. Where you change a single amino acid, um, but you can also do deletions where you remove a whole portion of a protein. For example, let's say you're studying a membrane protein, a transmembrane protein that has an extracellular portion of the protein, a membrane space of the protein and an intercellular part. Maybe you're just interested 
how do ligands bind to that extracellular portion? So you can delete out all of the other portions of the transmembrane and the intracellular portion. Or maybe you're interested in, uh, let's say like for the COVID-19 protein that's on the surface of the virus, maybe you wanna see how that spike protein that binds to the cell membrane, how that works, is it inert if that, if it, is it inert, is it no longer uh, infectious if you take out certain portions of that protein? So those are some ideas of like why you would wanna do a deletion. Um, and you can also do insertions so you can add portions to a protein. So you'll hear people doing like chimeras where you're taking different portions of proteins and putting them together. Um, so that's an example of an insertion as well. Okay, so that's just like a small aside about mutations. Um, but okay, you have your recombinant recombinant DNA. Um, these are typically plasmids. And when I say plasmid, that means a ring of DNA. Um, you can see here, define plasmid expression vector. Plasmids are rings of DNA that are naturally occurring in bacteria. Um, but here we're using an engineered plasmid. Um, but this ring structure is how bacteria store their DNA in plasmid type structures. So you have your recombinant DNA that's going to code for the protein you want. And the first thing you have to do in protein expression is introduce this DNA to your cell that's going to be spitting out um, your desired protein. So this can be called transformation, transvection, transfection or transduction. So all these terms are just indicating what type of cell type or what the vector is to get into uh, the cellular environment. So I think transformation is for bacteria, transfection is for eukaryotic cells, and transduction is if you're using a virus to introduce uh, the DNA itself. So all these two words just are indicating a different uh, process here. Um, so in this step, you introduce recombinant DNA to the host cell. So typically this is done by heating the cell with a heat shock that's gonna change the stability of the cell membrane, that's gonna be able, that heat shock is gonna have the cell bring in whatever surrounding it, which would be like your recombinant DNA in solution. Um, after you introduce this recombinant DNA, you also have to like screen for the transformed cells. So this is typically, let's say we're using bacteria, this will have some antibiotic present. So you can see in this ex plasmid expression vector here that there is a chunk of the DNA that has noted here AMP, and that's going to have ampicillin resistance. So you introduce the DNA, you take these cells, and you culture them on a plate that has ampicillin present. So the only ones that will survive will be the transformed cells that have the transformed are, that have the plasmid present. So you're not growing unnecessary cells that won't produce your protein of interest. Um, so that's the first step. The second step is then you know your cells have the plasmid, you have to grow those cells so you have a lot. After you reach a desired concentration of cells, so this is typically monitored um, with UV vis at 600 nanometers, that you want to reach a desired point of having an optical density at 600 nanometers, I think of like 0 0.6 or so. So this just means you have like, you just need enough cells. So 
so you can get a high a high yield um, with this. Okay, so after you have enough cells, the next thing is to induce the cells. Um, so what I mean by induction or inducing cells is you introduce a chemical signal. to tell the cells to make your desired protein. And this again is taking advantage of genetic engineering. So you can see, should have picked a different, okay, here we go, up here. So this is like the ring of the plasma. This is if you like stretch it out instead and view this. So you can see here, this is gonna be this step up here is going to be like the induction. So the chemical signal here in this example plasmid is IPTG. And this is a chemical that tells and turns on the LAC pr promoter. So lactose um, chemical pathway that's been in bacteria. That if you put this upstream, so higher up on the DNA strand here, if you introduce this chemical, this turns this gene on and anything following it until it reaches a stop codon down here. So introducing this chemical signal, it says, okay, start reading this gene and I've genetically engineered with my scissors and using uh, uh, the plasmid engineering that this is my desired protein, start making this because this gene is turned on. Um, so a common one if you're doing bacterial culture is this LAC operon. Um, shown here um, that was discovered in bacteria cells. So after that, after induction, you let them, you let the cells produce a lot of your desired protein. And after they do so, this is going to be much more than would be um, in the wild type, I guess, cell. So when we get into talking about cells, wild type means just non-mutated, non-engineered at all here. Um, so you, with this chemical si signal in the plasmid, you produce a lot of protein there. After the cells make your desired protein, the next thing to do is to break or lyse the cells. So break them open. to access the protein. So this can be done, when I say lice, that typically means that you're doing this chemically, something that disrupts the cell membrane. If I say break, that typically means like physically, and that can be with like a sonicator. So using optical waves, or not optical, sound waves, to break open that membrane instead. Um, <clears throat> so then after that, that's when we move on to like isolating and purifying, which we'll talk about in the coming slides. So um, any questions with protein expression? I know that was a lot of information I spat out at you guys, um, but breaking it, organizing it into these steps uh, gets out the main process of recombinant expression. Okay. There's no questions. We can, we can move on to purification. I do want to note that, again, relating this to like larger scales or bioreactors that I was talking more on <clears throat> the laboratory scale with recombinant expression, but this can also be done in bioreactors where you'll have like all your cells here doing that expression. And you have to have like specialized systems here that get enough oxygen to those cells so they can grow. That's why um, bioreactors on the engineering side of things for larger volumes are needed. Um, and then bioreactors are also used with like just pure biological sources that I've mentioned that 
They can be used for bacteria. Fungi are also commonly used with yeast cells, our common model organism. Plants, mammalian cells, even insects or um, I guess those would not be in a bioreactor, but even some of these biological sources can be um, from whole animals as well. So for a while, I think insulin was produced from pigs. Uh, so, or when you order different antibodies, if you're doing ELISA techniques, um, you'll see like different antibodies from like rabbit, goat, etc. that like they're literally using these animals to produce the desired uh, proteins and the like. Okay. Just wanted to note that. Okay. So moving on to, okay, we have our desired protein or a nucleic acid that we uh, produced or our peptide. Like how can we make sure, how can we just get the one that we're interested in? So you can think about when you're doing recombinant expression and you're doing this culture in a bunch of cells, you break those cells, there's gonna be like all the lipids, all the nucleic acids, all the proteins, all the cytosol, everything's going to be there. So how can you isolate your one protein of interest that's gonna be like the drug you want um, or your model protein that you wanna study so you get your PhD on time. Um, so the way that you do that is, we're just gonna call it broadly, is different forms of separations. Um, and separations is a way to isolate analytes by taking advantage of different forces. I guess different physical differences between molecules. And using like different forces to isolate them. So the techniques are typically categorized by the forces or, and also like the physical differences. Um, so can you think of, I guess there's lots of physical difference, differences that can exist between protein to protein, protein to lipid or sugar or different biomolecules. So do you guys have any ideas of, and different forces that we've talked about that are relevant to biophysics? Um, so do you guys have any ideas or, uh, or even thinking like separations you see like in the kitchen or the like, um, of what some of these properties we could take advantage of are? Yeah, Colin says size, that's a good one. Charge. Anything other than size and charge? Those ones are both good. Solubility. What about, let's say like you have a lipid molecule, you have density. What about, let's say you're trying to separate some lipids from, yeah, functional groups, structures, no, that's good. Yeah, those are all good ones. So we can list solubility. Um, and we're gonna discuss that today a bit with centrifugation and precipitation. Um, we can talk about mass, size, or volume. Um, so today we'll talk about dialysis, and on Thursday we'll talk about size exclusion chromatography. I guess I charge. So that would be ion exchange chromatography. Um, 
specific binding. So this would be Jack's point of having functional groups. So this would be affinity chromatography. And there's also similar to charge a little bit uh, polarity of the molecules. Um, so normal and reverse phase chromatography. Finally, hydrophobicity. So that's why I was trying to hint out with the lipids. Um, and this would be hydrophobic interaction chromatography. So this is giving you guys a layout of the different techniques that we'll talk about today and Thursday. Um, today we'll be talking about centrifugation and dialysis. When we move on to, on Thursday, we'll be focusing more on the different chromatography setups here. Um, but all of these differences that we mentioned, charge, uh, functional groups and the like, that's what you should be thinking about. Okay, once you have a product, what is the best method to use or how, in what order should you use these methods? So when you're trying to decide between them, you have to be considering things like how selective it is. Uh, like what mass or volume of your sample you have, um, how reusable they are, and obviously cost as well. Um, and even if like newer technology, multimodal, We'll touch on Thursday. Like, can you take advantage of multiple of these properties to separate some molecules? Um, so this is how, these are some things that you have to consider. Uh, so let's say you're at the end of your protein expression and you have your broken cells. Well, that's like a hot mess of everything. So if you wanna use something like with specific binding where you have so such a large number of molecules there, with a very expensive column that's used for affinity chromatography, well, that's probably not your best choice because at the first step, you want just a rough removal of all the junk from, I guess, the not junk, or you wanna purify that, uh, remove a lot of the crap first, I guess. So you would use centrifugation first and then move on to some of the specific binding and the like. Um, so hopefully on Thursday, I'll touch on that once we cover all these in more detail. Um, so I do want to go over centrifugation and dialysis before then in class. So um, these are the I guess, simpler separations where dialysis is where you're going to be using osmotic forces to separate out your protein from everything else. Um, so this is when you have, I guess, very clearly a large protein. I forgot to delete this text. So sorry that I'll be reading it off a little bit. So this is actually when you're producing proteins at the very end stage, you're gonna have a protein just mixed with some smaller molecules or some salt or buffer. And uh, the steps that you have here is that, okay, you have your protein and some type of solution here. Um, this rectangle is representing like your dialysis bag which is gonna be a semi-permeable membrane. And you select a pore size that will keep the protein in the bag, but leave, allow the salt to move out. Um, so you typically pick these guys out with like a 30 kilodalton um, or 50 kilodalton or 100 or so. Um, so not only are these used for in protein uh, purification, but these are also used in polymer purification as well, if you want to keep only high molecular weight polymers or so. So these cutoffs um, based on the molecular weight of your protein or so. So you put your solution into this dialysis bag. You have like a clip on the bottom. You got a clip on the top as well. So these dialysis bags are sold 
um, as tubing. Um, so you have your solution in there. Uh, I guess the important thing is when you're sealing them with the clamps, uh, you want to make sure they are very secure after you did all that recombinant expression. The worst, last thing you want is having your protein leak out when you put it in a large beaker where this is going to be your desired buffer uh, that's going to be different from the buffer or salt solution that's in the bag. So you put this, you might be using, let's say this guy is 50 milliliters you're going to be using like five liters of solution around this. So based on the equilibrium uh, here, if there's lower salt concentrations, the salt is going to move out based on, again, this osmotic forces here. Um, and you wait, let's say like eight hours or so, and then this will equilibrate and you'll have uh, lower concentration, at least in this cartoon of salt outside compared to or you'll have the same salt concentrations in and out. So then you loop this process several times to then get your end result of your protein and your like desired buffer solution with less salt present. Um, so pretty straightforward way of putting your protein in a desired solution. Um, so that's one way of help, helping purify your protein. I'm doing the same thing. Another one method that I want to mention is centrifugation. Uh, so this is based on sedimentation forces. So it's going to be based on frictional viscous drag. of mass differences in sample. So centrifuge, you're using centripetal forces. You're going to be spinning your sample. And so I guess this cartoon down here shows like, OK, you have each of these vials with your, let's say this is your cell lysate here with your desired protein and all the other junk. It's placed in a rotor and spun quickly. So if we took a slice from this vial here sideways, this is a spin direction into the plane. You're going to be having a balance of um, your centripetal forces here if we have a force diagram versus, I guess I'll label that, versus buoyant forces. and diffusion forces. So what this leads to is like more massive things will sediment at the bottom while less massive uh, things will stay in the supernatant up here. So centrifugation can be used here. I'm going to be focusing on using it for qualitative purposes to just separate things. Um, so you can see here with the schematic of, okay, you're spinning this in a rotor. There's a vacuum here to seal off the top chamber here. Also, um, for many biological samples, you'll have to do this under uh, cooler temperatures, and this helps prevent aggregation or denaturation of your protein. Um, so you can see like, okay, before you spin it, everything's mixed together, centrifuge it, you're going to have, this is going to be your more massive portions, that's called the pellet, and on top you're going to have your supernatant here. Um, so when you're using a centrifuge, it's very important to know like, which one of these do you want? Depending what you're doing, depending what you're purifying, you may want the more massive components or you may want the less massive portion. So make sure you know which portion that you're interested in and keep, if you're still pretty sure like you know what you want, it is worth saving, let's say you want the supernatant, still worth keeping that pellet around just in case there's something 
and there or something goes wrong. So don't discard it until you're done with the entire process. I guess it's just like a hint here because I've seen people have a brain fart and just like get rid of the supernate and dump it in some bleach and they're like, oh, that's actually what I wanted and waste some time. So you want to avoid that. So always keeping stuff around before you know you're done with it. Um, it's just a tip there. Um, some other points of centrifuges is that um, they can range from bench top to like floor models, depending on how much force that you need to separate uh, what you're interested in. Um, so bench top ones would hold like the little 1.5 milliliter Eppendorf tubes. Floor models can have like entire like, I don't know, I'm guessing that you can get rotors up that will hold up to like a liter or 500 milliliters or so, depending on like, okay, how much protein are you trying to produce or whatever you're using your centrifuge for. Um, so the most common centrifuge vendor I see is Beckman Coulter, but also like Thermo Fisher and the common uh, vendors also make um, those models. Um, if you're getting more specialized or separating things with like close masses, you can actually create a density gradient within your, uh, within the vial. So if you add sucrose is common or cesium chloride, that will create, yeah, a density gradient where you can have clear separation for things that are close in mass um, within that density gradient. Um, also the key thing when you're using cent centrifuges, if you haven't used one before, is like make sure it's balanced. So in this, that's what's shown in this cartoon that you have a vial on each side. If you don't, if you only, let's say if you take this guy out, you're going to make your centrifuge wobble. Um, because that mass is going to be shifting around when it's being spun and this can cause uh, damage if, it, if it's not balanced. So that's always a key thing. If you only have one vial worth of product, you don't have to split it in between two. You can keep one vial of your product and then add a vial of water, um, let's say, if, you, if or something of a similar density of what you're spinning down. Um, and the like. So those are just some practical points there. Um, and the last thing I do want to mention is this can also be used, centrifugation can also be used quantitatively. So this is an example of a Beckman Coulter ultra centrifuge um, where you can see that there's some, typically they're hooked up to a computer even. So um, this is a quantitative method where you have centrifuge plus usually a UV vis or um, interference detector. Um, and doing quantitative centrifugation at won the 1926 Nobel Prize in Chemistry to a Swedish chemist uh, Theodore Svedberg. So um, he actually defined the units that are used with analytical ultra centrifugation. So you can say this is going to be our sedimentation coefficient. Is what is read out here. And this has units of Svedberg's So it's S and it's actually, it's a non-SI unit and it's very interesting. It's 100 femtoseconds is one's Svedberg. Um, so it's a time, it's a unit of time. And this tells you how fast does it sediment. And something that sediments faster is gonna be more massive or larger in size. So. To get the sedimentation coefficient, it's going to be related to this equation, where this is going to be the speed of sedimentation. 
This is going to be your angular velocity. And this is going to be your radius that it's being centrifuged around. And this is then related to the mass of your particle times one minus the density of your solvent over the density of your particle. So these are, this is going to be a row here. Looks more like a P. And this is all over uh, a fractional drag coefficient. So this is uh, dependent on the particle size. And it can be related to the diffusion coefficient based on the Stokes Einstein equation. Um, so when you're looking at work, produced by analytical ultra centrifugation methods, they typically plot the sedimentation coefficient versus some other type of value. Um, I don't have the, that shown here. What this data I have shown here are different ways that you can run an analytical ultra centrifuge. You can do with, there's two modes, sedimentation velocity. So this is gonna be like, um, how do things change over time? So you can see, I try to make this color bar of, okay, this is a starting measurement and you're doing UV vis as a function of distance through, through your vial there. So at the starting point, almost you have a flat line at the top here, the protein or whatever biomolecule you're looking at or whatever sedimenting is equally distributed within the vial. And as time progresses and you spin this down, you can see that the absorbance goes to zero. That means nothing's there. Uh, higher up in your vial. And the deeper in the vial you go, that absorbance is shifting over time. So finally at the end, the orange part, well, the orange part here, everything's gonna be like pelleted down at the bottom of your vial that's off these axes here. So if you look at how this changes over time, you can relate that to the size, um, the shape, and the polydispersity of particles in your sample, and even conformational changes. Um, you can also run this in sedimentation equilibrium modes where you're not looking at this over time, and that's more related to like the molecular weight or um, oligomeric state um, or assembly that um, these can be used to understand the assembly of macromolecular complexes. Um, so centrifugation, not just used for, it can be used for purification, but it can also be used quantitatively as well as I would say like an instrument then. Um, so that's most of what I, that's what I had today. Um, I do want to note that talking about expression of proteins is in chapter seven a week. And then separations are under the forces sec chapter of this book, which I find a little, I understand it's taking advantage of forces, but it's, I would say that's very different as a method compared to like the force instruments like measurements that we talked about at the single molecule level. So I find his organization a little unique um, and interesting, but any questions at all?